Wow, that was intense. Please help me welcome the group from Third Person. It's writer director Paul Haggis, Moran Atias, and Loan Chabonal. Hello. Hi. Hi. Well, let me start with you guys, Loan and, uh, and Moral. Tell me when you saw this script because. I read the script. You sent me the script a few years, a couple of years back. And what did you think when you read the script about your characters? Because you work with him already on, on the next three days. You guys had a relationship. How soon did he get in touch with you about doing it? Well, actually, if I can start this, uh, this all began because she pitched me this idea when on the set of uh, next three days to do a multiple character or a storyline about relationships. And then we actually talked for a long time and developed it together. Uh, you know, and I, obviously I had Michael Nozick, who's, was, and, 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 and Deborah uh, Renard, who gave me a lot of input. But uh, no, this, this all came because of her. But you don't get a story credit on this. That's not right. Uh, uh, yeah. She gets Why is that, Paul? <laughs> um, I mean, for me, the, the biggest uh, gift and the big win for me was actually to make this movie. Um, maybe on the next one I will get a, a story credit, but I mean... Once I you've started. <laughs> <laughs> um, we worked on the next three days um, several years ago, and I came to the set and saw Paul direct actors and live in a constant creative state of mind. And I was just mesmerized by the way he was conducting everything. And I just hoped for myself to be part of that one day. And I started Googling ideas for great stories never been told. And I couldn't find anything that was, was powerful enough for I'm me. Sorry, you, you Googled the I, subject great stories that yeah, have never, it's never been, been told. told. That's going to be the name of my blog from now on. Okay. That's well, too good you have to, to start use. from somewhere. And I always start in a very generic um, research till I um, find something that is personal and that I can narrow it down. And finally, I didn't find great stories <laughs> with that title, <laughs> with that search word. Um, but I came back to Paul every time with some probably bad ideas and... Um, do you want to tell about that? <laughs> no, 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 no. I think you can. And then finally he, he told me, which would inspire every, every writer that wants to um, delve into this new craft, is write about something that you know or write about something that you love so much that you will be possessed with it for the next four or five years because that's how long it takes. And the one theme that came to my heart most of all these other stories were relationships and dynamics, intimate relationship between men and women. Um, so I came back to Paul for the 10th time with sweaty hands and, and a very, uh, it, was, it was neurotic in a way, um, and told him all these stories and ideas about all these crazy relationships and blah, blah, blah. And then he uh, said, that sounds interesting. And I said, well, interesting, like Americans say about everything and it's really nice or interesting for a movie. And he said, interesting for a movie. And that's how it started. Yeah, we, we talked for a long time and came up with, I mean, <clears throat> we talked. And, and you, as we do, you know, you see, you've talked about your own failed relationships. And so, and uh, surprisingly, she'd had some, and so had I. And, uh, and then from there, it was a process, you know. Uh, and it took me two and a half years to, to, well, it took me a while to figure out these particular stories, and we went back and forth on that. But then to, and then to, to weave you them together. You even changed the, the order from one of the scripts that you showed me. Yeah, no, there was. Yeah, there were many different. The characters were different. The betrayal was different. Uh, many things changed in, uh, over the years. And Lauren, how'd you get involved, Lawrence? When you saw the script, well, what did I you came say? at the end, so <laughs> I was not involved in the beginning of the process. Uh, no, I came for reading for the movie for part of Sam and. I got cast in the movie. That's really how it happened. I, I, I came at the end. I think everybody was already so on board. You don't, so, but you do get a story credit, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I hope so. Oh, boy, she this is French. wonderful. I, I I'm French. Elvis really I'm knows sorry. how to twist my little toe, I guess. It's easy to twist your toe, apparently. <laughs> um, but when you came on, what did you think of the character? Because, again, this is so in pieces that you end up seeing your character and... What do you think you, about my character yeah, or all of them? Your character, yeah. Uh, I felt that she was very different in all of them, that she was not really a victim. Like, she was feeling a lot of things, but she was not putting her issues on other people. 
you know, she was able to deal with it and to have a compassion for others. So I felt she was like a little Buddha, kind of. And uh, she had a lot of compassion and, and uh, she, she felt for the suffering of others. And, and we had to actually struggle about that when we were shooting. Of that. Uh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Really? How I you struggled start? a little. Yeah, I was. I remember shooting a scene, and I was just like, "Paul, I think he, you know, she's judging him. She's judging." He's like, "No, no, she's not judging." So yeah, she doesn't judge anyone. No, just, she just I said, felt I, I very hate him for taken what he did. away by the scene and by the, the situation, and I was like, "Oh no, uh, she's got to be mad at him." And uh, he was like, "No, no, I knew. she's not. She understands." So I had to understand. It was okay, but you know, the character. So I learned a lot. You learn a lot through the characters. You learn a lot about yourself. Well, yeah. But it's interesting because as I was talking and setting it up, strictly in the conventional terms, it's a very hard thing to sort of explain, but it's incredibly yeah. dramatic and compelling. So help set it up for the audience. I mean, a uh, it pretends to be three love stories set in three different cities, and it's in three cities where these characters could never possibly meet uh, in New York. Paris, Rome, and uh, but it's like many things in the movie. It's not quite that. It's something else. It's a bit of a puzzle, and um, uh, I mean, I, I loved the filmmakers of the '60s and the '70s, the people who redefined cinema for me. Uh, I remember watching uh, a Blow Up for the first time. I was like 17 years old, and I'd seen great American movies and loved them. <clears throat> But I, I was screening a print of this, a 16 millimeter print for a little film society I had. I didn't know what I was going to watch. And so here Antonio, he starts off to telling you it's a murder mystery. And then three quarters through, the, through it, he goes, oh, oh, there is no solution. You'll never find a solution to this. Uh, the, and, and, oh, oh, and guess what? It's going to end in a tennis game between mimes. And that's supposed to mean something. And you know, I went out of there the screening reeling and going, you can tell stories like this. And I didn't know really what it was about and I had to think about it. And I, I, I've done it several times since. I, I love the kind of film that you have an emotional reaction to, you have a visceral reaction to uh, at the end, but you don't necessarily know completely why. And you go out on the sidewalk or you go to the bar or the restaurant with, with your friends and you argue about it. And, and that's the kind of film I love. And so that's the kind of film I tried to make. Well, we know you love to argue, but that's another conversation. Yeah, I'm a contrarian, yes. Um, but each of your films starts off with kind of a false beginning. Each thing you've done, because you're just watching stuff on the, on the plane, getting, getting ready for this, you start off saying one thing, as if you want to confound the audience expectation. I sort of do. I sort of do. No, I, I think I, I like presenting one thing, Crash. You know, I presented you with stereotypes for 30 minutes and just said, relax. You're in the dark. I know you're a big liberal, but you know we, we no one's gonna see. You can you can you can you can relax now. Just shh. We know Hispanics. They all car park their cars in the lawn, right? You know, come on. No one's watching. You can laugh. And and you know, and Asians, they don't know how to drive, right? We all know this. And so that you could drop all your defenses. And, and black then, people steal cars. I absolutely. Mean, yes. yes. Let's not crash leave us into people. Rob cars. Exactly. So that so you could drop all your defenses, and then I could go. Oh yeah, now watch this, and I could fuck with you. And, and that's, I love doing that to the audience. I love saying, okay, this is what you are, relax, enjoy this. And then in this one, I, I don't, well, I have told you, but I, I don't tell you it's, it's, a, it's a puzzle or a mystery. Uh, I mean, the trailer does, but, but I didn't. Uh, and, uh, and, and I like taking genres and, and just saying, well, can we just do this with it? I mean, in the Valley of Ella uh, was a murder mystery. And then three quarters of the way through, I'd break all the conventions of murder mysteries and say, no, no. Now it's a moral mystery, and, and uh, yeah, I, I like doing that. But not only that, though, all your movies, all your originals, no, the things you worked on that haven't, besides uh, Casino Royale, have all been pieces about families. I think that's unique to you, that you make movies about parents and children. That's always a part of what you do. And I wonder what compels you to, to dramatize that relationship so I often. never thought of that. Um, I, I don't know. I think in here... Um, <clears throat> I want to explore what it's like to be a writer and what it's like to be a creator and, uh, and how selfish we are. Uh, I mean, we're extraordinarily selfish. But we're like anyone else who's really, whose career is really important to you. I mean, I was a, a furniture mover when I first moved to LA and I did it for four years. I worked eight, 10 hours a day and I'd come home and write two or three hours a night trying to get scripts to sell. And I had a child right away. I was married with a child at, at, at 23. And, uh, and 
someone's going to pay the price for our selfishness, and often it's children, because you know you love them, but you know you don't, you aren't really there for them a lot of the time. And I'm sure that that hangs with me. When you when you met with him on on, on the next three days, what was your first conversation with him like, Moran? The first conversation with, with Paul. What was the your first conversation days. on the next three days? What was that like when you guys met? I talk a lot, so okay. there was a lot of talking. I can't remember it was the first one, uh, but. Uh, I guess this was uh, this this curiosity um, of learning that I um, I feel it, it doesn't leave you if you are if you want to grow it doesn't leave you and that's something that I guess we share in common and um, that led to this collaboration and it led to then the next part of the collaboration which was the begging part. The begging part included me wanting really badly to play one of these characters. Imagine you develop a script for two years and all you think about is like, maybe I can play this character, maybe I can play the other character, and slowly, slowly, all these wonderful characters are being cast by huge movie stars. And uh, so I started secretly preparing for the role, the one role that I thought I had um, a better chance before Penelope Cruz was available and read the script. Um, but I was, I was going to libraries, reading everything I could possibly read about gypsies because I play an Albanian gypsy that lives in Italy. Um, and I needed to know everything about, about it because the script doesn't give you all these information. It's really about people doing things rather than explaining them, which is what brilliant writing is about. And um, started researching, read every possible book, documentary, um, piece of music, and just try to infuse myself with my head about uh, gypsies and their culture. And then slowly we got into production and, and, uh, and Penelope Cruz got pregnant. <laughs> and that was and you, beautiful. And you, were, and you were happy and for I, her, obviously. I just wanted, I was very happy because family is important. <laughs> and then I, I told Paul, Paul, this is a sign from God, and I know he's an atheist, but I'm like, whatever, you have to start to believe sometime. And um, it was a little sign for me, at least. And then I, I went to Italy, and I said, I can't get this character if I don't live in her skin, if I don't walk her lifestyle, live in that lifestyle, be a gypsy, really, truly embody it. So I went to Italy, Got, us a, got myself a raw place um, with no gas or electricity and stuff like that and just tried to live day by day. Um, and occasionally I would tell Paul about it, about my experiences as a gypsy. Um, and the first thing was going to the street and, um, you know, you have to make a living. And what was the first thing I could do? If I have no papers, no profession, um, you look dirty, you smell dirty, what are you going to do? You're going to start begging for money. That was the first thing I wanted to to um, to try out, and that was extremely difficult, because I'm sometimes a very judgmental person, and I see people begging for money in, here in New York or in L.A., and you judge them, and you think, you know, why don't you get a job? And when I tried to beg for money myself, I felt it was so damn difficult. Nobody would give me any money. It was it was really humiliating. And it took a lot of courage to actually ask for help. Um, and wasn't successful. The next level in, in the process was, help me with that because I never know how to say that word in English. Windshields? Windshields. Um, I try to, this is another pr profession they have. They, try, they clean, wash, windshields. windshields. Why is it so hard to say windshields? Um, windshields. And that was even harder. Because now I'm having an activity. I want to clean people's car because it's a very common thing in intersections in Rome. And people would honk and yell and spit sometimes just so I, can't, I won't get near to their dirty car. Only because I was wearing a long skirt and my hair wasn't washed for a few weeks. And that's where I started to feel this shame, the dirt, and a sense of pride. And non -apo not apologetic for the things I'm gonna, about to do if I have to survive. And that, that's... And that's when you knew 
she had the job when she showed up. Oh, she got the job when she came to Italy. But yeah, uh, with, but yes. When she uh, came all dirty and everything. Exactly. exactly. When she showed yes. filthy and did your yeah. windshield, then you knew she had the job. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> the smell was very convincing. You like, okay, get out of the room. Yeah, no, we no. Gave, it wasn't we gave her some smelly. Bad, it bad, wasn't. Gave her some bad teeth, and that that helped a lot. And I, I told her to grow if she had hair in her body, whatever it was to grow it, and oh, so God, she did. Please and, don't get. Uh, yeah. You want to yeah, talk about hair. that a little bit, growing no, that hair? The hair? I have a thing with hair, like all women, especially if you're, you're, you're Middle Eastern. You have hair. You don't want it in some place. And Paul, you have to grow hair everywhere. And I felt, Paul, you know, still she needs to attract this man. He needs to be seduced by her. And it's like you have to grow the hair. That was one thing. And then he insisted on changing my smile and having these prosthetic teeth, which are not real, just so you guys know, because I've received people that are excellent dentists approaching my managers and asking to improve my look so I can make it in America, and those are not my teeth. So, but it did help me, and I think also everybody else to treat me differently, which would, would when you develop a character, for me at least, I need to start thinking differently, because the way you think is also sometimes the way you then act and only when I was able to set up a different priority for this character, she doesn't care about how she looks because she doesn't have time to deal with it. She needs to, and if she deals with it, it's only for a reason, to take advantage of somebody, otherwise she will be taken advantage of. Lauren, talk about your first meeting with Paul and how you guys discussed the script and the character. What were you guys saying? Uh, well, about the film, I, I, I had to propose him something, so... Uh, Are we okay to hear this? Yeah, we talked about... Uh, no. Sadly, yes, you're okay, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, no, I, I started to think about her. First of all, she doesn't talk much, so I knew I had to be really, really uh, good at showing what she feels, and she will just not be talking, so I had to work on... Uh, how she was feeling and I said well I think she really uh, feels a lot but she doesn't show anything and he was like that's right that's exactly who she is uh, so then I had to start the work uh, before I came in for the reading um, to do uh, the scene and uh, I just locked myself uh, for a couple of weeks, you know, I used to go in acting class and just set up like a, a little like living room at the end of my class and just try to create a behavior for her, what she will be doing when she will be alone and how she'll be feeling. And I created a lot of um, personal uh, moments for her. Uh, I just wanted to make sure people will feel her because I knew I couldn't talk much. So it was really hard. Say, you know, it's really easy to have a dialogue and to interact with people, but when we can't, that is the hardest thing to do, I think, as an actor. Yeah? Really? Yeah. yeah. Because, because so I, I worked a lot on her. I know I, you know. <laughs> it's the fun part, actually, when you have no words. When I get more words, I actually, I, 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 I yeah, I have to disagree with my co-star. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I think words take so much away. Um, and behavior speaks so much more. And uh, not having, most of the characters are not very talkative, even Liam. Liam uh, character, um, Liam Neeson's character doesn't talk much, doesn't talk about it, with the way he feels. Um, There's a lot of dialogue there. Yeah, but, I mean, her character is yeah. particularly silent. Yeah, I mean, she basically, you almost treat her in a weird way, like one of those figures but from an Antonioni movie. Yes. With, which she sweeps in, and it's all about the reaction to her. Isn't yeah. that felt very sort of conscious of you doing that? Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's true. It was, I wanted one observer, and I knew I had no, not so much time on camera. <laughs> so there were very long. I'm like, hold looks. on, hold on. I gotta <laughs> make sure I can do this. So I worked. I worked hard. Yeah, it was. It was not easy for me. But what this movie really emphasizes is thing that you do. I mean, for me, we can go back to Easy Streets with this, where it's really kind of an emotional mystery where these characters are looking for information but really information to make themselves whole. Yeah. And that's something I think that's very specific and unique to you as well. Hmm. Interesting. 
And you see, interesting. You see, he does it again. See, that's that exactly what you're you, you said it much better than you I did. See? Sorry, or quite, interesting. Sorry, yeah. What does no, that I, mean? I, but I, but, but look at all these things you've done, and and I just want because obviously these are movies that are in some way each one of these pieces, even your Casino Royale, they're all very autobiographical pieces. There's a lot of you in all of these movies. I mean, that's the fun of the thing is to is to put yourself into characters who you totally disagree with. And, uh, and and to write from a perspective you totally disagree with, uh, and and I did that quite often in this movie. I mean, I was at the time I just finished a relationship with a woman who who was uh, it was just internecine is the very best possible way to say it, uh, and the kindest. Uh, but uh, but uh, she's, she's here say, right now. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, she's <laughs> saying, you know, you only want you, you just it's a game. You want me to open up? It's it's just a game. Uh, and, and the moment I truly truly open up to you, you will betray me. And I went, well, she's obviously baddie, but uh, but but she sounds hot when you but, put it that way. It was, she was very hot. But <laughs> but what if she's right? What if it's true? What if that it was just a game to me? I went, wow. That's kind of horrible to think. So I wrote from that perspective, uh, and I, I did it with all the characters. I, I, I like, like in the in the Valley of Ella, finding a character who I completely disagree with and writing from his perspective. It's, it's more interesting. But the way you're talking about this, it sounds almost, and that made me think about the way you prepare it, Loan. It sounds like an acting exercise. You try to tell yourself what the character is, and then to play against that. You know, that's. Yeah. Have you taken acting classes before? You uh, no, it? I've only did played myself in Entourage, and I did it badly. So that no, was he's acting. in this movie too. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, the back <laughs> of my head is in this movie. When, okay, so I'm off. You just see ahead. We staged. We staged uh, Italy. We staged in New York in, in Rome on the back lot because we couldn't afford to come to, to New York for a lot of scenes. We only came here for a few scenes. And one of them is the scene where Mila Kunis has to run out and, 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 and grab a cab and while she's on the phone. And so I stack up all these Italian extras in the background, and I, and I brought in cabs, yellow cabs from Bulgaria onto the street here. It's the only place you can find yellow cabs in Europe. So I've got all the yellow cabs in there, and I say, okay, you guys go out and you hail the, the, the cab. Of course, no one in... Italy knows how to hail a cab. It's not, you don't do that there. And so I'd get you know, them standing like this and this and so. So I said, no, 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 no. So I had Michael Nozick, my producing partner, a New Yorker, go out and say, he says, okay, I'll show you how to hail a cab. And he goes like this. So action, yeah, action, and all the extras in unison go. <laughs> I go, stop, 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 stop. You guys go into the deep background. I'll grab this extra. I'll hail the cab. Go. I'll, I'll watch it. And so it's, so it's me back in my bald head hailing a cab there. Was, uh, well, I played myself in Entourage, too. That's another uh, yeah, conversation. We'll, we'll have to compare episodes. What was yours? I've never seen it. Ooh. I can't make myself watch myself on oh, television. Oh, I've got to find it now. No, you okay. don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, really, you said it, really baby. don't. I'm gonna find it. I, I realize as we're talking now because... Um, we haven't gotten to a clip yet, so yeah, let's, show let's, a clip. let's show a clip. Let's couple of them. The, yeah, we'll, we'll set the clip up. It's, it's I guess it's uh, Liam and Olivia. Or yeah, that's just street. after they've met. And they're, sorry, they've, she's just come to uh, to Paris to see him. She's a young authoress uh, who's trying to get who's they're, they're having an affair, and uh, she's trying to get him to read her short story and give him notes. Yeah, and let's just do. I just show the second clip right after because yeah. okay. Yeah, we can show you the other Just run right into the second clip. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is Bar Americano, and uh, where uh, the um, Adrian Brody character, uh, who hates everything Italy, he's an American businessman who's there to steal designs, uh, and he just wants to get a decent hamburger and, uh, and an American beer and go home. And, uh, and so that's, this is the scene. <laughs> that introduces uh, well, four of the characters, at least, and the other two are... Uh, Mila Kunis and uh, James Franco's uh, uh, story. I can see why you're so apprehensive. You look awful. That's just <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. You should fight. You should file a lawsuit because that's just bad. No, no, no. It 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 starts better than it. Pr there's other scenes that look worse. No, seriously. I've seen. No, no. I've in the, the trailer, like in the times. trailer, I've I. In the trailer, I look no, like a rat. Let's, let's fight about something, because we haven't had a chance to fight yet, so let's go. No, Break out in the Shuniqua trailer, for, I look like a rat. I tell you why. why. I tell you tell why them about this. Do your character. What? Do that. No, do Shaniqua no, for them. Don't go there. Don't I'm do doing that. that. <laughs> I'm doing that. I'm, I'm going that path. <laughs> okay. No, what the fuck? No, okay. here's, here's what we're going to do, just to keep this away from the uh, turning into a deaf comedy jam. Uh, we'll take some audience questions. Will you take the microphone out if you guys have questions? Because, again, for me, Paul, I mean, when the idea of this guy finding himself through his characters. There's a, a figure like that in almost all these movies, somebody who's figuring out who they are 
by dealing yeah. with other people. I mean, again, just the idea of investigating. Crash, crash. Exactly that. And that's not conscious, but are you aware that... No, I think it actually is conscious. <laughs> because is. I, I think there's... Uh, I think pride is a, one of the seven deadly sins for a reason. And that uh, we, we, it's, it's the people often in life who, uh, who's, who think they know who they are, who are really sanguine with the fact that they're good people, and everyone says, that's a good person. Uh, those are the people that, uh, that perhaps don't know each other as well, don't know themselves as, as well as they should. Uh, the situation so, yes, changes it. What's that, sorry, Lauren? I think situation changes you know, the way people will behave because something horrible will happen to them and then they will just behave like the devil. Depends who they are. It yeah. depends who they are. Well, yeah, I think put, anybody but could. But you, you never know who a character is to put them in crisis. Yeah, exactly. My question, well, first I want to say, like, I enjoy going to the, to the movies and seeing films like this derived from real stories. Um, my question to you, Paul, is when you're writing a, f a film based on a real story, like, do you get any pushback from studios um, for, for having such a, a real story because like this day and age there are so many like blockbuster films um you know some blockbusters and stuff like that and i just feel like a lot of these movies don't they don't get made like they used to um so like when you go to a studios and, and you do have a real story like this do they are they on board immediately or do you get any type of pushback or sure you know, what's that? well first of all it's a mean, great question because yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. i mean first of all there's these aren't true stories but they are they are Human dramas and and everything I, I said this earlier. Everything in this uh, this movie is true. It just none of it happened. Uh, so you, you you twist your what what you know and what you what you've seen through you know, through the lens of fiction uh, to create truth. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't bother going to a studio with this film. Uh, it, it was there was no purpose to go to studios with this film because you knew they were never going to finance this kind of movie. So uh, and 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 why why torture them? So uh, I knew this had to be independently financed, um, and um, so we did. We we struggled for some time. We actually uh, we we took it to Cannes, and uh, a bunch of people said we want to finance it, and we chose the wrong person. Uh, and uh, that delayed us for 10 months until we found out that the, the guy was actually full of shit and had no money. Uh, and then I um, remembered meeting Paul Bruhls uh, who, from uh, Corson, who's a, a Belgian financier. I met him at, a, uh, at the Berlin Film Festival, and I went, I told my producing partner, oh, I'm going to make a call. And I called him, uh, and we had a 10-minute conversation there, but I liked him. And I said, uh, you've read the script, yes. Here's how I'm thinking of uh, and uh, here's the budget, and he said yes. And so uh, that was a, a very easy conversation. And now then how to get it done for that budget and where to shoot it, et cetera, and how to fill out the cast, that all obviously you know, was difficult. But you, the, I mean, it is tragic, and it's been so uh, ever since I've started uh, making movies. The Crash you, is, a, is another situation where you had Sandra Bullock and Don yes. Cheadle, yeah. and how is that movie made? Exactly. I'm saying that's, that's the tragic thing, is, is that, is that you, it's, it's not the 70s or 80s anymore. If you're going to do an independent film, it has to be sold overseas, which means you need to put act, uh, actors of note in it. In fact, you, you, you probably need more movie stars, I'm sure you do need more movie stars in an independently financed film uh, than you would for any studio picture with a bigger budget. Uh, so uh, you, do, you do get to, uh, to choose a few roles where you can go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try out some new actresses or actors, you see two of them here. But you, know, you, you, you go out and, and each, uh, each territory is gonna tell you what the film is worth, worth based on the writer, the director, and the cast. And that's how much you're gonna have to make the movie with. I wonder at this point, does it feel like it gets any easier for you? Because, I mean, with the exception of the Valley of Ella, you've kind of been making the, these films outside of the studio system anyway. Do you even yeah. go to them? Even anymore? that was Warner Independent, and they only did it because of Clint Eastwood uh, took it to them. Um, the, uh, yeah, no, I, uh, it, it doesn't get easier. I mean, it does. I mean, okay, fine. You win a couple of Academy Awards. It's, it's not a bad wow, thing. You know? yeah, it, it, okay. just, it does help. Um, but it doesn't help that much. You know, it, 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 you know, they'll recognize your name, they'll know that, but they're still going to look at the bottom line, they're going to look at the script, they're going to look at the bottom line, and they're going to give you a price that they'll make this movie for, and sometimes you can make the movie for that, and sometimes you can't. Now, do you find, because you just talked about this whole situation with a, a bogus uh, financier, do you find that they 
automatically will say, well, if you say you need 12, they'll go, we'll give you six? Sometimes, sometimes, no. This, uh, uh, Paul Brules didn't. He looked at the budget, said that's fair. We also put our salaries into the budget, so that helped. Uh, and uh, I so put my salary, that helped a lot. <laughs> and all the actors did oh it for... Oh, my God. All the actors Another did week it, of shooting. <laughs> all the actors did it for next to nothing, uh, and much less than they normally did. So he, they knew they were getting value there. And he looked at the budget and said, no, that's a fair budget, and, and we can, I can raise that much with, with this cast. Well, you guys tell me, what was the movie, what did you think when you saw the movie? Because again, as you very well know, it's a very different thing on the page than it is as a final product. So what did you think of it? For me? Felt the same way. <laughs> but yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, when I first read it, I felt that I saw one thing that hit me was the child, which I don't know why, just the child was like in my head the whole way. And then second time, other things hit me, and then when I saw it, I just saw one thing after another. It, it didn't come all together for me, and I also feel personally that I need to see a couple of times to have it going you know, through me. I don't know how other people fe feel about that. I feel it's a very interesting film because of that. You know, you need to see it a lot, and, and uh, to feel that you can connect because you connect to each story differently. So it's nice to take the time to watch it again so that's, and that's again. I feel whole, this way. That's the whole marketing plan is we're only going to have 100 people come to the cinema. But we're going to make them come 10 times uh, and to see it and sell 10 tickets. Well, New yeah, York you ticket. paid me to say that. But. And clearly, you're getting your salary now. He's paying you to say that. Uh, what did you think But, of you know, the movie? Elvis, I think like you, you've seen the movie a few times and, I mean... When we, for me, it was all, every day was another day of my dream coming true. I could never possibly believe that we're actually making such a special um, movie. Um, and when I, uh, Paul sent me the first uh, rough cut, and as an actor, you don't get to see it. It was my first experience as a producer. And when I saw it for the first time, I mean, I was ecstatic. It was so beautiful. Um, so emotionally gripping, funny, at places I didn't think would be funny. And when we even screened it in Toronto, there was dramatic scenes between me and Adrian, and I kept on telling Adrian, they should stop laughing because this is serious in this part. <laughs> and, and, and you never know how people react. And of course, if you're also playing that part, you don't think it's one thing or the other. So the first time I, I called Paul, I was yelling, oh my God, this is so amazing, so beautiful. And then... And then it went on its own journey in the editing room, which is another, um, for me, a first-time experience to see how the movie can be retold in so many different ways just, just by cutting it differently, just by starting from one person's face or the other person's face. And that was an, an extraordinary experience, learning experience for me. I will never be invited to an editing room, I know that, but... Um, what kind of, I'm sorry, suggestions were you making and seeing Some the good movie? I'm, I'm, I, I would send 15 pages of, of notes with, because I wasn't allowed to come to the editing room, which was in New York, not too far away from where I was staying. Um, and I would sit for weeks, enjoy trying to find perhaps other layers and other moments because they had to do the big, you know, the heavy lifting, the, the big work. I, I'm not capable of doing that, but I, I was able to find a few um, thoughts of one door opens and you see one character and the other character comes in, elements of water that would come in and out of, um, of the movie, music that I thought took away from such great, beautiful dialogue and such great performances that we didn't need music and it was just temporary music and I didn't even understand what that meant. I was like, Paul, why do you have music now? It's... He's like, it's just temporary. It's like, but it's still annoying. And then, <laughs> till you finally see everything come to life, even the music and um, and sounds of certain things, or about Americano, this kind of noise, and it just, for me, it was is it? I can't tell you how how blessed and and grateful I feel for having been his student. Um, and you can't possibly ask for a better teacher than him because. He's so respectful of everybody's opinion, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, and what does an Israeli girl from Haifa know about anything, anything about filmmaking? And he made me feel that my opinion values, and he, 
I, I thank you, Paul, so much. And <laughs> talk about the title. Yeah, third person. I mean, we discuss this a lot. Two things. One, uh, there's always a third person in a relationship. You just often don't know who that person is. You might think it's your mother-in-law, but it's actually not. It's someone from your past or something else that's affecting that relationship. And that, and that I found fascinating. Uh, and and it, was, it, it informed the script as, as we developed it. The other was uh, more obvious. There's a, I mean, the, Liam Neeson's character is a writer, uh, and he journals in the third person. And I thought that was fascinating, the fact that he distanced himself from his feelings even in his own journal. Uh, and then uh, he and Olivia's character uh, actually talk about each other uh, in the third person. And they flirt that way, and they, they, uh, and they torture each other that way. Uh, it, it, sometimes it's very cruel. Hi. Uh, my question's for Paul. Uh, you mentioned Blow Up, and I was wondering if you had any other films that maybe influenced this film specifically, oh God, yeah. and also just as a filmmaker in general. What I mean, filmmakers. Drawn. There are so many films, but uh, Buñuel, um, uh, Truffaut, Godard, Fellini, uh, Pasolini. There are, there are so many filmmakers that... Gosh, aren't there any American me. filmmakers, for God's sake? Just yeah, name none, one. None. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, because at that time... Oh, yes, of course, there were so many great filmmakers in the 70s, uh, but at that time, the, so the French New Wave, the Italians, they were just, they were on fire. And, uh, and that's just happened to me when I was a teenager. So that's, the, those are the ones that I go back to. Here's a last question. Um, do you, as you guys are working, do you watch movies? And I'll start with you, Lauren. As you were working on your character, did you watch movies to help you at all? Or would that have gotten away for you? <laughs> Uh, no, it depends, uh, for my characters, it depends who's the character, I would do something different. I'm actually not always inspired by films, I'm inspired a lot by art. Yeah, I'm a painter too, so I actually work on characters as I create art as well. So how, when uh, you were working on this character, did you look well, at... Well, she's an artist too, yeah, I mean, yeah, Paul that's was a... uh, <laughs> kind enough to I make her, her an her artist, art. so I was really excited. I made some drawing for the film, you don't see them, they're kind of far, but they're mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, for her, I mean, in that case, I actually worked on creating her own art. It was very interesting to be in her head. So I, I actually created a whole German impressionism, um, yeah, you know, in colors, because it used to be in black and white, you know, all those really old films, silent films, and I made it in colors. So Paul was like, yeah, that's exactly who she it is. It was very, very cool, because German expressionism in happy colors. It was, it was fabulous. Yeah, because it's a chaos, <laughs> yes. but then you put colors, and that's what she was trying to do. She's trying to put colors into chaos, that character. So in that case, that helped a lot to create her. What were the influences? I, I had way too, time, too much time to think about the answer, so it's not going to be a good one. Um, with this character, I wasn't... Um, the, entire, the preparation, when I was in Italy, I didn't have a television, um, so I wasn't watching any film. But I was watching one... I did go online again. Can I tell him about the love scene? Of course. Google, okay? So this is... <laughs> Paul, as an incredible filmmaker, I mean, it's very rare that a filmmaker would ask his actors what do they think about a scene so kindly and with such curiosity. And we, me and Adrian Brody, my incredible co-star in this, in this love story in Rome, we were asked what do we feel about this, about a love scene that we have to, and you know, in a script, it's just written in one sentence. They make love, and that's it. And how, what, what do you start with, who's on, t you know, all the things that an actor asks himself, how do you, what's going to happen? And he sent this, this, this email, and Adrian was very cool, he's like, Paul, whatever you, you think. And I was like, what, what does that mean? <laughs> like, Paul gave me a question, and it's a creative question. I have the opportunity to now go back to Google and see all the love, all the love scenes ever made in film. I literally spent... Is there a website for this? Some no, kind you of just put, put on YouTube and you put love scenes and you see all the love scenes. And, and, I, and when you look at a thing technically and you just take it out of a film, you can study it better. So I saw all these beautiful movies that their love scenes didn't really inspire me as much as I remembered them. 
And then I was like, okay, so I'm not getting anything here and I do not want to suggest something that was already done before. I started, I went back to Google and I went to um, couples, love cup, just, it's not my first language, so it's like random words together, pictures. For through, maybe through photography I could get inspired for, the, for this love scene. And I found this beautiful, stunning photograph, a black and white photograph from the 60s with Paul Newman and his wife in bed with their clothes on. And they were faced head to head and legs opposite. And it's an, it's an aerial shot. And I sent it to Paul and I said, Paul, this is just so poetic and it says so much about these two people. And we've never seen something so childish and so innocent before. And he loved it. Yeah, no, and I that, did. And, and then, did. but then, he wrote the scene because it's. I just this was just an image. Now, how do you take that and create an incredible? This is one of, I mean, my favorite scene in the movie because he wrote dialogue into this position. He makes the character get to that position in such a clever, genuine, beautiful, raw way that describes this character and. It, it helped the character be even more layered. And we went to, we, we came to the set and I didn't know he was using that. And we were shooting the scene and then I see somebody drilling a hole in the ceiling. And I look up and there's a hole and then they put a camera and I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna sh shoot it that way. And it's, and we all, everybody's like, oh. And it's an awe moment. So that's how this guy works, amazing. Do you watch movies at all when you're making movies? Is no, I, I make a point. I, I, uh, I don't watch movies when I'm making them. I don't think of actors when I'm writing the, the script. Uh, I, I'm too easily influenced. Uh, I think when you're doing the script, uh, if you start thinking of actors, you will automatically write for something they have done well before. And, uh, and then if you cast them, you're doing them a great disservice. Uh, because you want to cast an actor that's going to stretch, that's going to surprise you. And you're not going to get that actor anyways because if you write for something you've done before. So no, I push those actors out of my head and it's hard sometimes until I've finished writing the entire script. And this was two and a half years of just seeing these characters' faces. And then I, I, I think, who would be good for this? And I thought, you know, we'll start with Liam Neeson. Uh, and the same thing with movies. I'm too easily influenced. Uh, you know, I've got the, the great films. I've got Hitchcock in my head, you know, every, every frame of every film. Uh, I don't have to, to, uh, to, 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 to watch him now to think about him. Well, let's thank these guys for being here today. Thanks so much for being here and coming. Oh, yeah, she had, okay, she's got a question. You're her last question. There you go. Wait, wait, wait. Come on. Hi. Um, this is my friend who's also a filmmaker, and I, I texted him. I told him I was here, and I asked him, what would you ask Paul? So he texted me. He said that he wrote this script from the inside out without outlining first, but that it was a nightmare. Ask him why was the process of writing the script particularly difficult, and if he thinks he could make it easier on himself next time. Yeah, that's a great question. It was a sign for coffee. We're going to be here for a yeah, while. Yeah. No, yes, that's absolutely correct. That's why it took me two and a half years to write, because I purposely decided to let the characters take me where they were going to go, and often they took me to blind alleys. I'm a structuralist. I know how to structure a movie, but this one I wanted to really explore the questions and let the char characters answer those things, and it was very, very difficult to do it this way. Crash, I structured. These but still, you sent me the first version of Crash. You s emailed me a copy of it in 2001, yeah. Yeah. and it changed from then. So I, I think you always, you want to feel like th there's always room for improvement. You th you feel like you're always writing these movies. Yeah, but I'm, but I am. But this but I, uh, this one. The lack of structure is, is what, what caused, initially, the lack of structure, not knowing where each of the stories would go. I know what the stories were, but not where they would go. And, uh, and that, uh, that was tough. So yeah, I, I don't know if I'd, I would never recommend writing it that way unless you have two and a half years to burn. Uh, and I just, but, but I think it really helped because I, I really got inside these characters and explored them and then found, uh, you know, found out how to tell their story. But it's not something I recommend, no. And now let's thank Paul and no. Miranda. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Good question. <laughs>